We will now look at the Kelvin body or the Voigt body and its deformation in terms of the mechanical model. We know that a spring indicates an elastic deformation, a spring indicates an elastic deformation and the dash pot can indicate the viscous deformation. In this case, the spring and the dash pot are arranged in parallel connection. It is not in series connection, it is in parallel connection. In this case, imagine I apply a force, that is what I write, I apply a force to pull this perforated piston, the movement will take place, but it will not be instantaneous. I mean to say that this elastic deformation will not be very instantaneous, it will take some time to initiate. So, in other words, we can say that it is an elastic after effect, when the force is applied, the elastic deformation damped is damped by the viscous component, therefore the elastic deformation does not take place immediately. Now come back to this, once the force is removed, the force with which I was pulling, I have removed my hand, the force is removed, what will happen? The spring will try to come back to its initial position and because of that, the piston will also move in this direction, but it will not be a, a free and easy movement of the spring only. It's tendency to move backward will be damped by the viscous component of deformation. So, this is the situation in which the Kelvin body or Voigt body deforms. In certain cases where the earthquake waves interact with the rock, the rock can behave in this manner. Let us have a look at the possible constitutive equation. We know that for a viscous component stress is equal to the viscosity multiplied by strain rate and for elastic component stress is equal to Young's modulus multiplied by strain. So, I am putting a question to you for a Kelvin body will it be ok if I write stress is equal to this plus that. So, it remains as a question for you. You may send me the answer whether is this right or wrong. If, if it is right why so and if it is wrong why so. Now, let us consider the situation that the force or stress with which this was pulled has been dropped and how the strain will fall with time. That can be represented in this curve of strain versus time. Initially in the experiment, the strain increases with time in this manner, but it is decreased when the stress is removed from here onward goes like that. So, these two will be dissimilar in nature. Let us look into the difference between two terms. One is the breaking strength or the breaking stress sigma b another is the yield point and the related term is the yield stress. They are dissimilar. What is the difference? Imagine I am plotting strain along the x axis and the stress along the y axis and this is the curve almost a linear relationship is found, but beyond this point the material breaks. Say I was pulling a spring and after the sigma b amount of stress the material breaks. Since the material breaks, so that particular experiment can stop at that point and this stress sigma b is known as the breaking strength of the material and now compare with this case where the strain is plotted along the x axis, the stress is plotted along the y axis just like that and the stress strain relationship is almost linear, but at certain amount of stress we can see that the strain rise actually decreases what was happening over here. Now, this point P where this curve shows a curvature, strong curvature, this P point can be called as the yield point and the corresponding stress sigma y can be called as the yield stress. So, these are the two different terms. What happens beyond this point P, we will be, I will be explaining in, in terms of different curves in subsequent lecture. We will go deeper into the stress strain relationship and I will be presenting here only the summary of the uh, information. Let us look at the work hardening material also known as the strain hardening material. What happens here is that in a stress strain relationship, first there is a linear increase of strain as stress is increased, 
but afterwards this linear relationship is violated this kind of curve is produced if we plot for this work hardening material in a strain versus time plot time is in the x axis strain in the y axis then this kind of curvature would be demonstrated what happens if the material is called a strain softening one then in the stress versus strain relationship first we can find this kind of linear relationship almost linear but then the curvature is quite different from the work hardening material and in this case the strain versus time relationship will move like this the graph will go like that and in comparison to them we can think of the plastic substance which we have studied in school that the stress versus strain curve will initially be almost a straight line elastic and then comes a plastic behavior and its corresponding strain versus time curve will be a straight line like this now as you see in these three diagrams these are all stress versus strain plotted and in all these three diagram is strain versus time being plotted now let's look at how the geological bodies deform and what and what kind of curves we can think about the in geological case creep is a important thing which indicates very slow deformation or a very slow flow of material in geological cases such as the geological faults and the shear zones the slip rate is few millimeter per year which is which can be basically same unit as kilometer per million year 1 millimeter per 1 year is equal to 10 to the power 6 millimeter divided by 10 to the power 6 year which is equal to 1 kilometer per million year so to remember for the geologists that 1 millimeter per 1 year is same as 1 kilometer per million year this is the geological rate for example a fault might be moving in the past with a rate of 3.5 mm per year now in the laboratory whatever the experiments are performed compression or extension such a slow deformation rate is never produced the essentially things are much faster in the laboratory but suppose we create a situation where the body deforms very slowly maybe the body is too rigid and we are applying compression for a very long time the experiment can run for even one year or more in such situations we can have two possibilities start with the compressive test the material is under compression or there can be another possibility of extensional stress in this case note that both the graphs have got strain versus time plot in case of a compressive stress first a linear relationship can be found with change in time the strain increases almost linearly but then there is a change in pattern of the curve can be observed and then the, there can be another change in the pattern of the curve so we can break this curve into three parts 1 2 and 3 this part of the behavior can be called as the transient creep this t stands for the transient regime s stands for the steady state regime and t dash stands for the tertiary regime and once we look at the tensile tests the material is pulled and the body is deforming slowly not very fast and the experiment has run for has been run for maybe for even one year or more in that case you can compare this curves and the pattern of change in this graph is different in this case also we can break this curve into three parts 1 2 and 3 this part can be called as a transient creep or the rock is under a transient regime and there is a steady state regime what happens there the strain time relationship is almost a straight line and which is almost parallel to the time axis and after that comes a tertiary creep where this curve actually moves up and we can see that the compressive behavior and the tensile behavior of the rocks can be drastically be different we can represent the creep curve in this way the y axis as strain percentage and the x axis as time this curve can be represented by s is equal to a plus b log t plus ct plus d this is the best fit s is the total strain and d is the strain during the tertiary creep what is the effect of confining pressure on the rocks take a single rock type and 
we have plotted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 graphs. A towards E is the increasing confining pressure applied on the same rock. So when a single rock was taken, an experiment was done at a lower confining pressure. A is the stress strain relationship. Then at higher confining pressure B and then C, D and E has been observed. What do we understand from this? Let's take D and E and try to understand. It will be repeated. Let's take D and E and let's try to understand. To generate some specific amount of strain, in case of D, I need this much stress, say stress 1 is required. And to create the same amount of strain, I need in case of E, a much higher amount of stress 2. We can see on the y axis 2 is more than 1. So what does this mean? This means that as the confining pressure increases, A to B to C to D to E, the rock strength increases. and vice versa. For example, the rock strength decreases with decreasing confining pressure. Now this issue confining pressure and the relationship cannot be straight away taken into the geological case. This is a laboratory case. In the geological case at different depths the rock can be considered for deformation but then there is an effect of temperature, fluid and several other factors may also come. Now let us look at the effect of anisotropy within the rock. Let us take the case of cylindrical core which will be taken, uh, taken up to the curve 2 indicates the case of a cylinder which is perpendicular to the foliation. So this is the foliation perpendicular to that a cylinder has been cylindrical drill core has been picked up. Number 1 over here dash line indicates that the cylinder is parallel to the foliation. Now here there are two kinds of graphs, one with the dash lines, another with the continuous line. The dash line indicates extension. How to remember? Imagine the line itself has been pulled and it is broken into pieces, so it is produced by extension and the solid line indicates a compression. Now let us look at curve 1 and curve 4, both are product of extension and number 1 has been picked up as a cylinder parallel to the foliation. Say these are the foliations and parallel to that it is a crude sketch. The cylinder has been picked up and number 4 is a case when the cylinder is perpendicular to the foliation such as this. We see that to generate a specific amount of strain how much stress is needed in case 4. 4 dash is the amount of the stress required and for case 1 how much is the stress required? 1 dash and now we can see that stress wise the magnitude of 1 dash is much more than 4 dash. So from here we conclude that the cylinder parallel to the foliation is stronger and more difficult to deform than a cylinder perpendicular to it. And what has been concluded in terms of extension or the extensional stress, the same thing will work with 2 and 3. Now we are going to see the role of strain rate within the rock. In the y axis we are plotting the differential stress along and along the x axis we are plotting the strain in percentage. And these are the different curves showing stress strain relationship for a single rock type. What is the difference in the curves 1, 2, 3 and 4? Curve 1 to curve 2 the strain rate has been increased that means a faster rate of deformation has been seen than 2 to 3 and 3 to 4. So in this case again if I take a certain amount of strain and I want to see for how much differential stress it has been produced then we find that for curve 1 a lower stress is required whereas for curve 2 a higher stress is required for curve 3 a still higher stress is required and for curve 4 the highest stress is required. So what does this mean? This means that as the strain rate is increased to produce a certain amount of strain higher stress is required 
or alternately if the deformation in the laboratory the strain rate is extremely low then at a much lower differential stress that deformation can be taking place. What is the differential stress? Think that I am applying stress in two directions sigma 1 and sigma 3 then sigma 1 minus sigma 3 or sigma 3 minus sigma 1 can be considered as the differential stress which is different from mean stress which is also different from the deviatoric stress. Let us understand a few parameters which henceforth will be required. The Poisson's ratio nu is defined by taking a cylinder imagine an axial extensional stress is applied and this cylinder with circular cross section gets extended and yet maintains its circular geometry. So, the previous diameter is much reduced over here. In this case the Poisson's ratio is defined as the change in diameter per unit original diameter divided by the change in length per unit original length. Now I have a question in case we start with a cylinder with an elliptical cross section or we start with a cylinder with circular cross section but when it is extended or elongated stretched then an ellipticity develops in the cross section. In that case how to find out the Poisson's ratio. Let us look at the Poisson number m which is equal to 1 divided by nu. Okay. As we see this is length divided by length and so also here. So, Poisson's ratio is unitless and therefore, the Poisson number is also unitless. Now, this nu or the Poisson's ratio varies from minus 1 to 0 0.5 requesting the students to do very simple thing. What is the range of the Poisson number? Let us define the rigidity modulus g which is given by tau divided by gamma. Tau is the shear stress and gamma is the shear strain. So, basically what it says shear stress is proportional to shear strain and the proportionality constant is the rigidity modulus. In one way you can compare this with axial stress which is applied and the Young's modulus E or Y and then the strain. So, it is a proportionality constant. G's presence leads to the change in shape of the body and the G for the rock varies from 2 to 5 multiplied by 10 to the power 11 dying per centimeter square. Note that the Young's modulus of the rock Y or E for the rocks is usually 10 to the power 12 dying per centimeter square. So, for the rocks usually we can say that the Young's modulus is bigger than the rigidity modulus. There is a relationship amongst the rigidity modulus, the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio given by this relation. The incompressibility is defined by K. Here H is the hydrostatic pressure, hydraulic pressure or the lithostatic pressure and V is the volume of the rock under consideration. Consider this is the earth surface and here I am considering some unit of rock which has a, an initial volume of V0. How much is the pressure at the top? Say this height is H then the pressure is given by H rho multiplied by G. Consider sedimentation is happening here. So, the H is basically increasing and after some time the height is H dash. So, the pressure has changed to P dash is equal to H dash rho multiplied by G. So, the such a situation when the pressure has increased. So, P dash minus P equal to H dash minus H multiplied by rho multiplied by G. In this case small h actually represents the hydrostatic pressure and delta h is the pressure difference. So, here P dash minus P is our delta h and when once this pressure is increased the body due to extended pressure might reduce its volume a bit delta v. So, in this way the incompressibility k is defined and an inverse of k 
which is beta equal to k inverse is called as the compressibility of the rock. Rocks are almost incompressible. Whereas in case of unconsolidated sediment, the compressibility is much higher than that of the rocks. Let's look at how the temperature variation can affect the rock strength. We have plotted here along the x-axis strain in shortening percentage and stress compressive stress over the y-axis. This is for some this is a plot for some dry rock at 150 degree centigrade and there is another curve showing the dry rock at same rock at the room temperature. Now we observe that to produce a certain amount of strain the dry rock at room temperature requires a higher stress than that at 150 degree centigrade. So this means that as the temperature increases the rock the solid rock will be easier to deform. If this is the curve for 150 degree centigrade for the drier rock at a higher temperature higher than 150 degree centigrade I can expect such a curve expected. But note that this is so long the material is almost like a solid material. If the material melts the properties may change the graph may behave differently. Let us look at how the ductility varies with the confining pressure. What is ductility? It is the percentage strain before the fracturing of solid happens. And for 4 rock types 1, 2, 3, 4 these curves have been drawn. The general observation is that the ductility increases for individual rocks as the confining pressure increases and it is a non-linear relationship. The second observation is that there can be certain value of ductility at a certain confining pressure for the two rock types. This may happen. We are going to see in detail the flow law for the steady state creep which I have already defined for the compressive and for the extensional uh, deformations in the laboratory. Creep I repeat indicates very slow rate of movement, deformation, flow etc. within the rock which can be few millimeter per year. There are some geological cases where few centimeter per year that means almost 10 times the movement of that millimeter per year has also been reported. So here actually we can write it is possible to write or think about at least an equation which is a function of stress, strain rate and T for temperature. This kind of combination can be made and an equation might be set up which will indicate the flow law for the steady state creep of the material. This is not going to be the equation of the transient creep or the tertiary creep which I have already discussed. Now one observation is that as the temperature is higher the viscosity of the material the fluid will be reduced. If the material gets lower viscosity that means its fluidity will increase that means the body will be more prone to deformation. This is a, an observation so temperature certainly plays an important role in the viscosity. Does pressure affect the viscosity? Yes, but the pressure affects viscosity not in so sensitive way as the temperature affects. So although we are not writing pressure term here, pressure actually affects, but it affects in a more subtle manner. Now one of the forms of this equation which is more very popular is that epsilon dot the strain rate is equal to A multiplied by sigma to the power n and then e to the power minus q divided by rt. Such an equation is true for the high pressure temperature deformation. So must be a deep crustal deformation or the upper mantle deformation. Here sigma is the differential stress, here T is the absolute temperature not in degree centigrade but in Kelvin. R is the gas constant and Q and N, this is Q and this is N, they are the empirical parameters. Now geologists have tried to fit and find out the different values of Q, N, A for different rock types and truly speaking a most accurate equation for the steady state creep we do not have. In fact geologists keep revising the equation there are other possible equations other than this in the literature. Now let us look at this term N. We can see if N is equal to 1 then that equation can be simplified as stress is equal to viscosity multiplied by strain rate. This is our well known Newtonian flow. Whereas if n is not equal to 1 then we can call it a non-Newtonian flow behavior. 
n is equal to 3 to 5 commonly for the rocks whereas n less than 2 has also been found but it is uncommon mostly found from the fine grained rock materials. Is there any rock for which n is equal to 1? Certain salts in the salt diapirs and salt domes has been proved that that, be, that salt behaves in a Newtonian flow manner when it extrudes from bottom towards top. And there are also some salt diapirs and that is interesting same salt material where uh, the non-Newtonian behavior of the flow has also been proved. So, it is difficult once you think about salt one single material one chemistry it can behave in some situation in a Newtonian manner in some other cases in a non-Newtonian manner. Now, let us look at how the deformation of the material gets altered in geological case when grain size varies and the water content varies. We start with a classic example of olivine which can be found in the upper mantle and suppose we consider olivine in the laboratory and run the experiment of stress versus strain at various conditions. What are those conditions? Fine grained olivine which is wet or coarse grained olivine which is wet and we also take fine grained olivine which is dry we also take coarse grain olivine which is dry. So, this is these four are basically the combination of dry and wet and coarse and fine grain minerals. And those rock types with olivine nominated nature are run in, in the experiment. So, these are the four curves that are produced and from these curves what do we comment? I have drawn this diagram over here once again say this is some amount of stress which is applied and for that applied stress we can see the coarse grain and the dry sample of olivine is less deformed this much of strain is produced. Whereas, if I compare this orange curve with the yellow curve, yellow curve indicates coarse grain and wet sample of olivine then more strain is produced because this is the strain axis and this is the stress axis. So, the comparison between these two what do we understand that what is common in them is the coarse grain material and what is the difference dry and the wet. So, the wet sample is more easy to deform. Now, if I compare between this one and this one what is the common thing and what is the uncommon thing between them. The common thing is that both are dry sample one is coarse grain another is fine grain. So, we can see for this coarse and dry this much is the amount of strain and here for this curve this is the amount of strain. So, we can see fine grain and dry sample got more easily deformed than the coarse grain dry sample. So, what we understand by comparing these two we understand that the fine grain material is more easy to deform. So, these are two important things that come out wet samples are more easy to deform and fine grain materials are more easy to deform. So, if there is a combination of wet material and fine grain together that should be softest material which is shown by this white curve. So, you can see suppose this amount of stress is applied which material is undergoing maximum deformation or maximum strain it is this white graph and what is that fine and wet. So, in this way we understand how the grain size and the water affects the deformation. When I discussed about olivine it will be more applicable for olivine rich rocks and their deformation that means essentially we are talking about the upper mantle. So, from the laboratory experiments we can have an idea how the upper mantle material will behave depending on the grain size and depending on the water content.